So I'd like to welcome you to this presentation of Majesty and Mystery of Crop Circles. And uh, my name is John Root. I'm a naturalist. I've done this program many times at libraries and senior centers. It's a fascinating topic, for sure. Uh, I didn't know, and I should say from the outset that this program is funded by a grant from the Hopkinton Cultural Council, so I want to thank the Cultural Council for funding this event. So I didn't know anything about this phenomenon until about 10 years ago I read a book called Secrets in the Fields by Freddie Silva. Up until that time I had only vaguely heard about crop circles and I thought of them as being something that happened in the 80s and maybe people made them and maybe they didn't and that kind of thing. I had no idea that they were happening every year. They were get, and since the 80s, they've been happening every year and they've, be, they've been becoming more and more complex, really. And there's such a, a wonderful variety of patterns. Perhaps looking at this cover slide here, this might be the first time that you've ever seen such a thing, right? You, if, when you think crop circles, perhaps you think circles. And as you can see, you're seeing a lot more than circles. I mean, you are seeing a lot of circles, but you're also seeing straight lines, you're seeing patterns. So on with the show, and I want to explain that in my research, I discovered that, that crop circles were not the only mysteriously appearing patterns out there uh, on, on terra firma, so, or, or, on the, uh, uh, or on water for that matter. So uh, this term pteroglyph is, is, a, is a word that you can use to talk about anything, any mysterious designs, whether they're on land, any, any part of the land, not just crops, or on water. For example, here's one back in the mid-1970s, a circle. No question that that's a perfect circle. Uh, and is there a natural explanation for that? You know, that circle of ice? Well, we don't, we don't really know, but you'll see a lot of them. Now, here's the first photograph uh, that I have of a, that I've been able to find of a crop circle. 1978, there were actually five of these large circles in the field. Uh, if you roll a die and you get five, that's what the pattern looked like. And there's the farmer's wife and her two daughters leaving the field. If, uh, uh, but I, I, I will say that previous generations of farmers and their families uh, share mem many memories of, in fact, sometimes uh, people will say, I remember when I was a child, we would play in them, you know, in those mysteriously ap appearing circles. So they certainly have been happening for quite some time. And now let's pause and think about, well, well what is the meaning of a circle? Is, is there a possibility here that we're looking at sacred geometry? Is it a sacred symbol? After all, uh, those uh, people who study such things certainly believe that, yes, the, the, uh, the circle is in fact a symbol of ineffable oneness, the indivisible fulfillment of the universe. And we could think of the circle as being a two-dimensional representation of the sphere, which is itself an ultimate expression of unity, completeness, and integrity. So perhaps these circles are, and are meant to be inspiring to us. And now, speaking of the history of crop circles, let's go way back. 1686, Robert Plot was a naturalist. And I'm a naturalist, so I have I experienced an affinity for him. And when he saw this in the field, and he was writing a book about the natural history of Staffordshire, well, he felt obliged to come up with at least some explanation of what had caused what he saw. And this is what he came up with, this illustration of something coming from the skies, a, a funnel shape with a, with a square shape inside that that would have created the design that he saw. Now, roll, uh, fast forward to 1983. One large circle in the center and four in, in the shape of what w some people think might be a Celtic cross. And you can imagine how people, it really got people's attention, right? Uh, and the next year, um, Sir Dennis Healy's wife saw a bright red light over the field when this was being, and, and these were almost all formed in the middle of the night. So she saw a bright red light uh, over the field when this happened. And in this case, again, the same pattern that we're seeing here. Uh, in 1985, uh, a strange white substance was found the, in the formation, which was thought to have been responsible for everybody developing severe <laughs> chest complaints who smelled it. Yes, you have a question. Yes, could you give us locations on these? These are, these are all, virtually all the images that you have already seen and will be seeing are in southern England. 
the counties of Hampshire and Wiltshire in southern England. So there's a natural question, why are so many crop circles happening there? I would point out, though, that there are crop circles that happen elsewhere, here in the United States, in Canada, other parts in Europe. It seems to be mostly a north, northern hemisphere phenomenon, but not entirely. But uh, uh, researchers, uh, there's a, they are, uh, their sense of this, their understanding of what's happening, think of the, all, all these sacred sites in southern England, you know, the Stonehenge and Avebury uh, Circle and Silbury Hill, and I mean, there are just so many sacred sites. Why were they located there? And the answer seems to be that there's an aquifer, under, under, underground aquifer, and there's chalk right above it, in, 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 uh, you know, a layer of chalk. If you uh, scratch the, the sod, you'll find it. And somehow, as water's percolating through and entering the, the aquifer, that seems to set up some electrical, you know, strong electromagnetic currents that people who douse for energy, just like people douse for water, these people who douse for energy are actually able to experience. And I think that, you know, one, we can assume that our ancestors also were aware of these energies, and that's why they located their sacred sites where they did, right there in southern England. So either these sacred sites are being honored by the crop circles, or maybe even the energies are being used to create them. That's an open question. So. Now we've got some circles with, uh, you know, with, with rings inside them, right? Rings of, of crop that are still standing, and three of them in the same field in 1986. And once again, on the, on the, you know, in ice, there's a, a moat, isn't there? See, see the people right there to give you a sense of scale? Um, if you were a team of humans, how would you have done that? Okay, how would you, you know, because to cut it, uh, well, and I mean, I suppose it's possible, but uh, it, it does, it does lead, you, lead us to wonder, right? Uh, so in 88, this one uh, was accompanied by an extremely large geomagnetic disturbance that was uh, me uh, measured by instruments there. And now, Gerald Hawkins uh, is a pretty bright guy. He was the head of the Boston University Astronomy Department, and he wrote this book, Stonehenge Decoded. He realized that, it's, uh, that Stonehenge, uh, back in the day, you know, a few thousand years ago, I guess, when this was built, it was erected to be an, a primitive computer that would, be, that would predict the eclipses and uh, an astro astronomical calendar every, every year at the, you know, at the uh, equinoxes and that sort of thing. You'd be able to see the sun at a certain uh, place. So he came, now, Gerald Hawkins became interested in crop circles, and he decided to measure all of the circles that had happened so far. So he, you know, he would measure how, how large is this circle? How large is this ring? How large is that ring? And he compared all of those measurements, and he realized that when he compared them to each other, some were exactly twice the size of others. Some were exactly 50% larger, or you know, five, four, you know, one and a, one and a quarter times, 25% larger. Each of these ratios that correspond to the notes of a major scale were also found when he compared the crop circles one to the other, but none of the ratios that correspond to the sharps and flats were found when he compared them. Clearly, this means that every, you know, there was, some, there was a kind of a riddle that whatever intelligence has been making these, and they certainly are made by intelligence, uh, intended for that riddle to be solved, or was hoping for it somehow, but, but no one was coming out and, and saying it, right? Now, this one is quite different from what you've been seeing. As you can see, those plants, I mean, I wish you could see it, because that's the closest I can get, that I don't have any better photograph, but those plants aren't all down inside each of those three circles. Some of the plants are grouped, and there are seven concentric rings and 48 spokes, which you can kind of vaguely see, right? The seven concentric rings, the 48 spokes are much more difficult to see. How is that done? Well, some of the plants in are in groups that are bent like this, some are bent like that, and some are bent like that. That is how that 
And <laughs> now, now, how in the world would a team of people in the middle of the night been able to create that? Seven rings, four, 48 spokes in three different circles. Yes. Yes. Right. So if you. Not any major scale, but definitely. No. I, what I mean is, any, this would have worked for any major scale. Okay. Then, in other, so good, that's a good question. So, in other words, in the in this key of E flat, okay, you still have certain notes: E flat, F, G, A flat. But it's it's the but the ratio is the same when you compare those notes. Do re mi fa so la ti do. Right. Those are when I'm singing up the scale, I'm changing the pitch, and the pitch for every major scale has these ratios. There's so many types of scales. Right, there are 12 different scales, right, yeah. So back to this one, and uh, Gerald Hawkins, the same fellow who realized the major scale was being represented by the sizes of those circles, he also discovered that, well, that's the Euclidean theorem, isn't it? This is one of the four Euclidean theorems, and there it is in the field. He even came up with the first Euclidean theorem himself. And now, it's not just the fact that all the plants are down inside this circle. You can see that the way that plants are down is very intricate, isn't it? They're swirled in the, in the center. There's a swirl in the opposite direction around the room. And then these very precisely uh, arranged quadrants, you know, where the, the plants are either lying down like that or they're lying down like that. And all these are clearly made to be seen from the air. So you see, uh, you know, some quadrants look lighter than others depending on how they're reflecting the light. It seems to be part of the art, right? Now, uh, in 1990, we start to get more elaborate. And in fact, here, here's an example of, uh, apart from these circles here, there are also these very narrow orbital rings, which you see. They are so narrow that you wouldn't be able to walk inside them without making them wider. <laughs> there are only a few plants wide. Right? So you would disrupt the circle, but you would make it wider by walking inside it. This seems to prove that no one, in fact, did walk inside those circles and, and made them, you know, uh, flatten them mechanically or anything to, in order to make them. Excuse me? Oh, th these are all in, in, in various crops uh, in farmers' fields. So it could be wheat or barley or uh, and a whole variety of crops. Uh, cheese foot head. Uh, this, this formation, which it's, it's been uh, guessed perhaps this is a symbol uh, of a vibrating tuning fork. And this one, I think, is, is kind of humorous because here it is on Telegraph Hill. And doesn't this resemble a message, like a telegraph message, you know, with something beaming, right? These, these arcs here, beaming a message out to space or out to a destination. Now here's a, here's a picture of a fellow, this fellow uh, discovered this crop circle, he, you know, he happened upon it and he said, okay, take, take my picture in front of it. And as someone, as the photographer was taking the picture, this sphere fell, narrowly missing his head, uh, right in front of him. Here's the magnification of it. Large quantity, quantities of these metal spheres were found on the edge of this field. Now what's going on here? Well, could it be that the energy that created the crop formation also had and was, was still <laughs> making these things fall from the sky? Okay, perhaps there's a meteor that was passing overhead that, it, that had been in the way of the, <laughs> these energies that had been being beamed down to create those patterns. Now let's look at one of these patterns here, and we can see that they're very neat. I, I need to explain here that these parallel lines are called tram lines. Uh, in Britain, they call a truck a tram. And so in, in the fields, they want to be able to, you know, uh, predictably go in certain places, but they don't want to be driving all over their fields. So they stay uh, inside those tram lines when they're applying, the, when they're spraying the fields or when, when they're harvesting or whatever they need to do. Uh, so clearly this is, and, and so that gives you an idea of the scale. You know, these, these tram lines are, are the width of a chassis, the width of a truck. Now, you can see that these are very neatly created circles and straight lines creating these rectangles here and this rectangle here, which was right inside one of the tram lines. 
but what you don't see unless you really sit down and if you have the mind to do this sort of thing, you would discover that there is actually a large and sophisticated pattern with three five-pointed stars, several circles, other than the circles that are already there. In, the, in other words, what happened was that, and, and again, I'm not going to say who or what you know, source of intelligence this is, but clearly there's a, pat, there's a design that, that creates that, well, let's, let's, uh, let's look at this first step just for, for a sake of explanation. If you make a circle, and this is the center of the circle, and make the circle exactly the right size so that it touches the edge of this circle, and then you create a five-point star inside that circle and make it just so, right? Get, get, get one of those arms of the five-point star right on the, on the center line there. Look at what's happening here. It exactly touches the corner of this rectangle, exactly touches the corner of that rectangle, and exactly touches at five points the perimeter of the circle, doesn't it? Now what that means is that um, this circle had to be exactly that size and had to be exactly that distance from here, otherwise that wouldn't work, would it? The, the, these these quote-unquote coincidences are not coincidences at all, right? It's, it's part of the plan. And so you can see that uh, at every other stage there are other circles, other, uh, you look at these other po points where the uh, rectangles and the corners of the rectangles are touched and you get the idea how this is a pattern and then the, this, uh, these circles and rectangles were created using that pattern and then the pattern was basically erased because when we see the, the formation we don't see all those circles and five-pointed stars, do we? So that's, that's part of the plan, if you will. And this is the final result. But sometimes these things are just plain beautiful. I mean, here we have a monument. This is clearly a man-made monument inside, you know, in the landscape with a circle around it. Here we have a circle that seems to be a stand-in for the monument. Doesn't it symbolize, symbolize the monument with a circle around it to echo that circle? In July 1990, this was so extraordinary that people gave it a new word, pictogram. And how could we call that a crop circle anymore, right? That was a pictogram. And people, thousands of people came from all over the world to go inside and just wonder, what in the world is going on here? People from all over the world. Now, and this is the same formation, by the way, just seen from different angles. And I would like to know why this formation, which was done in a dry lake bed in Oregon, there's no vegetation here. This is not a crop circle, right? It's a design etched you know, in, the, in the dry lake bed, in the desert, 13 miles of lines, exactly replicating a sacred Sri Yantra symbol of the Hindu faith, which is what this is and this is. These are two representations of the Sri Yantra, nine perfectly interlocking triangles. They're so, this design is so sophisticated that modern mathematicians are impressed that uh, millennia ago when this was conceived, before there was any modern mathematics, you know, and they're impressed that, that they would even be able to come up with such a thing. But people did that, you know, and it was intended to be a way that you would, you know, if you were a, a devotee of Hinduism, you would focus on the dot right in the center, and that would elevate your consciousness. It would help you to achieve enlightenment, you know, just, just like saying a mantra or meditating. It's a form of meditation. Well, darned if this exact pattern wasn't uh, replicated on a very impressive large scale, right? Because you can see there's people right in the middle. You can barely see them. 13 miles overnight with no explanation. Why was this not on the front page of every newspaper in the world? And then you go on to <laughs> the next year, 1991. If you were the warden of Barbary Castle and you heard this loud sound, this, the most colossal roar coupled with a pulsing hum, at 3.30 in the morning, sounds like, you know, planes going over, 100 planes going over, you would wonder what is going on here. <laughs> and sure enough, there was something very significant. This formation, which is the one on the illustrated on the cover of that book that I referred to earlier, the, my first introduction to the 
subject, Freddy Silva's book, Secrets in the Fields. That was what happened. And could this be some kind of three-dimensional representation of a two-dimensional object? Or, excuse me, the opposite, two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional pyramid or, or something of the sort. One idea is that, well, that's what he, he thought he, he heard, this, this colossal roar, and he compared it to the sound of 100 planes going overhead, but there weren't 100 planes going overhead. I mean, you know, he was there, right? He looked up in the sky, there was nothing there. And when he woke up in the morning, he found that? Well, he was, he was awake anyway. That w it was his duty as the warden, I guess, to be awake through the night. And went, so yes, that was discovered the next morning. The same, the same you know, just a, f a few hours later after hearing, hearing that sound, that formation was discovered. Now, it couldn't have been a UFO because they don't make any noise. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. But you know, what's interesting to me is that already you've seen several different phenomena, you know, the, on this one, but probably not any of the others, what, you know, this loud noise, okay, was featured, <laughs> shall we say. You know, there was a soundtrack for this one. But then there was a strange white substance in another one. There was the red light in another one. There was like, you know, if you're, if you're someone who, you're an, a, a fireworks artist or something, and you're thinking, okay, well, how am I going to wow them this time, you know, for the 4th of July, and you're going to cook up something new? That's my impression of what's happening here. They, they quote unquote, keep on coming up with new things to impress us and to get us to really pay attention, right? Yep. Did you say that all of these manifestations give salt or chalk? Or is that just one place that gives chalk? Um, they're not all over chalk. There's some over green sand, some over neither. But uh, so there, there's no one predictable geographical explanation. Now, talk to us. Someone tramped out in the fields. So you see that crude, right? Those letters, talk to us in letters right there. OK, someone wanted to, to have these things explained and, and figured, well, that would be the best way to appeal for an explanation <laughs> from above, you know, where these thing, th things seem to be coming from in a field. And here is the answer that came in a field. And in 1991, in August, Gerald Hawkins thought it was Latin, and he interpreted it as, I am against acts of cunning. <laughs> Simon Burton said, I have hidden at present. He, thought it was, he also thought it was Latin. But he, he saw something different. And two other people thought it was in Hebrew. The creator wise and loving, said one. A new breed of people, said the other. I don't know which of them is right. Maybe all four of them are right to a certain extent. But clearly, the answer is we aren't going to tell you exactly what we're saying. This is a challenge. Much like finding those notes of the major scales, this is a challenge for you to understand and to use, you know, to be curious, to use every faculty you have whether it's your reasoning or your intu intuition or whatever, to try to understand these. Is that like the next day in the same place? Yes, yeah, the same next day. Place. Now, back in 1991, you might remember that Doug and Dave, right, in their two fellows in their 60s, stepped forward and admitted, quote unquote, admitted that they had done all the formations to date. Now, look at, think of what you've just seen, and there were others, you know, I've left out a lot, you know, those are, but those are just represent, rep, uh, representative. How, uh, you know, the men who conned the world were, well, shouldn't we ask whether they were trying to con us by saying that they had made them all? And should we wonder why the newspapers were so eager to dismiss the whole thing as being done by a couple of 60 years, 60 plus year old guys who are out to have a good time? Because that's what their claim was. Oh, they, you know, they just came up with the idea at a pub one night. Oh, let's have a good time. And this is how they claimed they did it. Really? You know, perfectly straight lines at dead of night using a wire dangling from a baseball cap to serve as a sighting device. And, but they would have had to jump or pole vault into standing crop, standing crop. And their wives never caught them in the act. Okay? Never noticed that they were gone in the middle of the night. And furthermore, this, this is an example of their artwork. How impressive is that to you? Not very, right? Not very. So on with the show. These are some of the crop circle features. Plants bent an inch above soil and gently laid down geometrically precise patterns. 
light burn marks at the base of stems, altered cellular structure and soil chemistry, discrepancies in background radiation, alteration of the local electromagnetic field, depletion of the local watershed. Sometimes there's less water below than the, there, somehow water has, has dried up or been used in the creation of them. Uh, dousable, long-lasting energy patterns, measured effects on the human biological field. We'll be talking about all these in the course of this. So here's a woman, Nancy Talbot. I have had several conversations with her. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I consider her to be the world's foremost expert on crop circles because she does real research. She compares the plants inside the formations to the plants outside. She takes the soil and, you know, she and her um, partners analyzes the soil. And she's had many other experiences, which I'll get to later, which she would never have believed herself if she hadn't had them herself. So in any, in any event, uh, the BLT, uh, Burke, Levengood, and Talbot, BLT Research, is a website which I recommend, bltresearch.com. T is Nancy Talbot, okay? And this is what BLT Research has done. They've, they've taken plants from the fields and then uh, one thing they discovered is that the cell wall, ab abnormally enlarged cell wall pits in the bract tissue. This, doesn't, this is never seen in plants, except in plants that are, on, uh, that are in formations. Uh, node elongation, these, things, these nodes seem to be stretched. Imagine if your elbow was stretched. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just like, how in the world could something like that happen you know, to a plant that the node is stretched? This is the node right here. Or, and this is how the plants are actually bent in the fields, the node is stretched and bent. All right? So here's the bending of pl plant stem nodes uh, towards the bottom of the, state, uh, of the uh, stalks. And this fellow, who's a PhD, Elcho Hasselhoff, a Dutch uh, gentleman, decided that he would measure just how stretched are they, and he found out that the ones right in the center of the circles were stretched more than the ones towards the perimeter, which, and then he figured out, well, that must mean then that the source of energy that's stretching them must be a certain specific distance away, because if you hang a light bulb above a surface, well, it, it, it's brighter in the middle, and it's less bright because it, towards the edges because there isn't much, as much light, the light uh, is not as intense when it reaches the edge. See, so you see that he could determine exactly what that height was. I think it was something like four or five meters above that circle. So here's something else that happens to plant stalks. Sometimes whatever energy is visiting them seems to boil the sap inside those nodes so that you know, it just gets too hot in there and, they, and there has, to, uh, has to escape somehow. The steam has to escape. So there are expulsion cavities that are discovered. Again, you never see these expulsion cavities in nodes anywhere in nature except in crop circles. And then some plants are bent which are simply unbendable. These, are, uh, if you visit a field of um, the uh, uh, oilseed rape, which, which is the plant that canola oil is made from, and if you try to do this, if you try to bend, I mean, you can't treat a stalk like it's a pipe cleaner, can you? You can't just like bend it and expect for it to stay bent. The, the plant has other ideas and the plant's gonna go right back up. Right? Or if you keep on bending it, it might snap. Those are the only two choices in terms of mechanical effects from uh, attempts to bend. So how is it that these plants are in fact bent in the fields? Other effects noticed. Look at these stunted uh, wheat, uh, wheat seeds, wheat seed heads in the formations compared to outside because the plants are still living but, you know, these, uh, in this case, the corn, the corn kernels are stunted in the middle of the formation. And here, the corn kernels, when germinated, are simply not as vigorous as the corn kernels uh, from outside the field. However, watch this. Exactly the opposite happened in a formation in Medina, New York in 1991. Corn kernels taken from the center significantly outperformed the control outside the, what was happening here? What, what energy had visited the, and in some cases, obviously, the energy was in, inhibiting the, the slides we just saw. But in this case, the energy had actually made them super seeds. They were more vigorous. And the ones on the edge were still a lot better than the ones 
outside, but not quite as good as the ones in the center. Again, that effect of, you know, the ones in the center are getting the most energy, right? Isn't this something that scientists should be paying attention to and, and, attention to, and, to, one, and to wonder, well, what are these energies that can make seas uh, so vigorous? Isn't this... <laughs> and in fact, uh, John Burke, the B of BLT, who is now deceased, but he did try to patent this idea and, and tried, tried to find applications, practical applications for it. Um, here's another remarkable result. These seeds were taken from inside the formation and they're synchronized. All of them are performing pretty much the, uh, equally, are growing with equal vigor compared to outside the formation there's the, what you normally expect. Some seeds are more vigorous, others are less so. How is it that all of these seeds, having benefited from the uh, energy, were almost synchronized in their growth? And as if that's not impressive enough, here we have a woman named Diane, Diane Conrad, who's a geologist and decided to look at the soil in this formation that happened in uh, Canada, Alberta, Canada. And she, uh, realized when she, when she measured the degree of crystallization the, or greater ordering of the atoms inside the formation, that, she, that this, is, this degree of crystallization had never been for, before been documented in surface soils. As a matter of fact, what you'd expect that crystallization to be seen, where, where you'd expect to see that is in uh, sedimentary rock which has been exposed for hundreds, if not thousands of years, to both heat from the Earth's core and the massive pressure of tons of overlying rock. Now, if that kind of energy was actually visiting the field to, to transform the soils in that way, to create that degree of crystallization, then why wasn't all of the crop, in fact, that entire area around it, just incinerated? I mean, <laughs> right? If we're talking about... Uh, the heat from the Earth's core and the pressure from tons of overlying rock, wouldn't you think, think that that, but I, I guess the riddle here is that even though that happened to the soils, whatever energy visited the formation to create the formation itself must have been so controlled, must have been so brief, okay, that the plants were just whoosh, laid down. In fact, uh, eyewitness reports confirm this. There have been some 25 people who have seen crop circles happen, that it's very brief and very controlled. Now furthermore, looking at the soils here, it looks as if uh, something, you know, this, the, this is the next year where the previous year there had been a crop formation and now the soils don't seem to be very fertile or there seems to be something wrong. The, the crops aren't growing very well. Uh, where there had been a formation. But in this case, it's the opposite. Look at those, that dark green color in the same area the previous year where there had been a crop circle. And as if that's not enough, let's look at this circle in the winter following a formation. Notice how the snow is melting less, less rapidly than outside. But the exact opposite is happening here. The soil, uh, the snow is melting more rapidly over where there had been a formation. I have no idea why there are these, there are these variations in, in delayed reactions in the soil. Suffice it to say that, uh, you know, when I said earlier that maybe every one of them has a different footprint. Maybe there are different effects that are being used or maybe different elements that are being added to formations, all of which are meant to kind of impress us with the variety of these things. You're, you're asking how they're doing it. You've got to ask those brothers how they ask, do it. Oh, ask, oh, ask uh, those, those two fellows. Yeah, they're not brothers. They're friends. But yeah, yeah that, that would be nice to know and how, how they would account for that. Uh, here is the L of BLT, W.C. Levengood. He, uh, he was analyzing this, these uh, pebbles and plants in the crop circle that had, been, that had iron fused onto them. And perhaps that iron from a, was from a Pleiades meteor shower that was caught in the crop circle making vortex of energy and that then fused that iron onto the pebbles and the plants. Now, here's Busty Taylor, the pilot, photographer, crop circle researcher. He, he showed a video here and people were watching it and when one, one person said, wait a minute, I just saw a light cross 
an upper right hand corner and he had never noticed that light so sure enough when he saw it himself i was gobsmacked as he said you know he's a brit right i was gobsmacked by what i saw <laughs> he had never seen it before and these l lights traveling they're called balls of light bols they've been seen so often that people give them a name like bols they're they're seen to be kind of hovering over the field sometimes more than one sometimes in tandem almost like they're sightseers after a formation they're they're kind of checking it out or maybe uh, who knows what's what's going on here but it's part of the whole uh phenomenon and and here is a non-crop circle right this is a another pteroglyph in the middle of the night a, a gentleman in russia noticed that suddenly it was as bright as daylight okay and then, you know, the light vanished. And the next morning, there it was. He could see it from his window. These cons perfectly c created concentric circles in the snow with another series of concentric circles, smaller, but there are so still several rings there overlying this series of concentric circles. And in 1992, seven people got together and decided that they would see if they could communicate telepathically with the source of these formations with the whatever intelligence was creating with them they started to meditate now there was no agreement beforehand what they would meditate about they just thought they would meditate five of the seven of them got this image in their minds spontaneously and then the next day there it was which seems to indicate that yes and there are a number of other examples of this where there's there seems to be communication between crop circle makers and those who are studying them. But they came in the same area that those people were meditating? The next day it was right near them? It, right near them, yeah. Yeah. Isn't this a beautiful uh, mon uh, mandala, you know? And you see a, a pentagram, which uh, in ancient Greek culture was seen as the fivefold nature of humanity, talisman of good, good health, and the land upon which this was discovered belongs to a farmer who cares for sick animals. Now this is clearly a sacred site in southern England, the Avery Stone Circle. Clearly it's being honored <laughs> with this beautiful formation, which you can understand by why people would call this a web. Now remember how you saw a lot of geometry that was used to make an earlier formation? Do you suppose there might be some geometry that's behind this one? Indeed, yes, there is. And there it is. These, so you can imagine that this series of concentric circles would be present for each of these. It's just done once, so you can see the idea. But for each of these circles, it would also be surrounded by concentric circles in order to make all these lines here. And notice they're, again, perfect uh, five-pointed star, the circle here another five-pointed star, another circle here, everything fits just right. And then there are these seemingly random and perhaps humorous thought bubbles just attached off to the side. Now, often you'll notice that in a particular year there seem to be themes that are explored. It's almost like an artist exploring a particular theme. And here we certainly see heavenly bodies and orbital rings. And in this one, this is clearly meant to be our own solar system. This is the asteroid belt surrounding, well, there's the sun, and then there are four metallic planets, you know, the smaller planets of which we are the third, and there's, you know, Mars, Mer Mercury, and, and uh, Jupiter are the other three. And, but if you look at our, um, our orbit, re our, uh, our, uh, this, this is the orbit that the Earth belongs on, but Earth is not there. The other three metallic uh, planets, sh shall we say, are, are represented, aren't they? Well, where is Earth? Some people think that this might be a reference to the very obvious fact that when you're standing on planet Earth and looking into the skies, you can't see planet Earth as a heavenly body because you're standing on it. It's a question of perspective. Therefore, perhaps that's why Earth is not represented as being visible on this diagram. I don't have anything to say about any of these. I just want you to enjoy them. There are many um, such photos uh, that, 
well, could this be uh, double helix? Right? Is that symbolic of the double helix? Perhaps. The double helix of DNA. And now we have Stonehenge right here, right across the street, this intricate pattern of circles, Julia set. Hard to even count how many circles that would be, all arranged very precisely. And here is the eyewitness account, because this happened in broad daylight. It's, that's atypical. Usually the, the, the formations occur in the middle of the night. So here we have someone who watched it happening, a mist about two to three feet off the ground. It was spinning around. There's a circular shape, seemed to get bigger and bigger. The mist got bigger and bigger and swirled faster. There was a clear space between the ground and the mist. Strangest thing this person had ever seen, calm summer's day. Imagine if you had been there watching it too. And as if that's not impressive enough, the triple Julia set later that same month, look at the size of that pattern. Remember, these are tram lines where the trucks go on the field. These are huge formations, absolutely stunning. And each of these circles here has a standing tuft in the center. Just a little, a little touch there, a little detail. Standing tuft of plants in the center of, of these circles. And could that be symbolic of the wheel of joy? Perhaps. And then once again, Stonehenge is honored with a formation which looks like six trees emanating from a central point inside a circle. Two in one field. Now, if you can imagine if you're a researcher, you might be curious. How many of these standing sections of crop are there? Uh, there might be some secret code or something, you know, some might be significance to, to that number if you know the number and how many total squares there are. So you're in the field and you're starting to count, walking down, walking down the row here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wait a minute, seven, six, eight. Wh which one am I on? Oh, I better go back to the beginning. I've lost count. And then they start counting one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Oh, I've forgotten what number it is. I, darn it, I thought I was keeping close track, but I guess I've forgotten. This has happened more times. It's, it's almost as if the analytical side of our brains, the left brains, are taking a little bit of a holiday, <laughs> and the right brains, our right brains, which are more intuitive and spatial, and you know, perhaps those are heightened when we're inside a crop circle. How else to explain why people who ordinarily can count just fine are not able to do so very competently when they're inside a formation. Let me explain a fractal. Picture my hand, and picture if I was able to sprout hands, tiny hands from each of the tips of my fingers and my thumb. Tiny hands have now sprouted. And then picture much tinier hands have sprouted from those fingers. That's, that's called a fractal, a, a repeating pattern that goes, that goes on and on and gets smaller and smaller. So here we have a triangle, and then triangles are stuck on each of those th sides to make, give, you, give you a six-pointed star, and then triangles are stuck on each of those sides to give you this figure, and it can keep going on and on, right? But in this case, it doesn't keep going on and on. It, it's, it just stops right there, and then these ornate circles around something right near something called Silbury Hill. Now, Silbury Hill is a very interesting uh, public works project. Thousands of years ago, before there was any fossil fuels to move Earth with, people spent a lot of time and energy to make this huge hill. Why did they do it? Well, we've talked about electromagnetic energy in, on the Earth's surface flowing uh, in, in the landscape. And if farmers put seeds, the, the seeds of their crops, on top of that circle, then they would get the same effect as the photo that I showed you earlier of the corn in 1991, the, the corn taken from the center of the crop circle that had been exposed to energy and was much more vigorous in its germination and, and more stress resistant. And that is in fact what John Burke, the B of BLT, 
he wrote this book, uh, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, about this hill and about pyramids all over the world. He calculated, and here's the studies to prove it, germination of corn, corn kernels placed on top of the Lost World Pyramid in Tikal on a morning with extremely powerful electrical activity compared to the controls. And you can see how much those seeds benefited from being placed right up there on that uh, lost, lost World Pyramid. So there's the evidence. Another fractal. And there's the chalk that, you know, someone a couple hundred years ago scraped away the sod to reveal a horse. You know, you could do that. You could make anything you wanted, right? It's kind of a form of art, I guess. But this, this really doesn't have anything directly to do with the sacred uh, or mysterious formations because there's, uh, they're clearly understood how this is done. Could this be sacred geometry? This is Vesica Pisces, the fish, inside this. And there it is, right here and right here. This one, by the way, is a hoax. This one was done by people. And while superficially it might seem pretty elegant or you know, uh, precise at any rate, but it does not seem to me as eloquent as the others. It doesn't, it doesn't have the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's really pretty boring to me if, if I, as I look at it. And it also, you might notice how there are these little white lines that connect these circles. Well, the real deal would never have those white lines connecting. It's clearly some, someone used those as paths to get from one circle to the next. And look at the pattern of the plants being swirled around, which creates this pattern as seen from above. And here again. So a lot of the artistry has to do with not only where the plants are bent, but how they're bent, what direction they're bent, so that when seen from above, it will shimmer in certain ways. Speaking of what happens from above, this thing that looks like a cone, uh, a, a conical shaped cloud, appeared right above this formation. I don't know what the sequence was. It might have been afterwards. I'm not sure. This is clearly the representation of a, uh, an, an eclipse. As you progress from right to left, there it is, the total eclipse, eclipse right there. Remember the pictograms from 1990? Look at that one. Huge. Just keeps going and going. So you can see how, uh, in the course of nine years, how things have progressed in terms of complexity and size. And this name, Lucy Pringle, she takes photographs from above and she puts them on her website. You can look for her, uh, her web you can easily find her website, Lucy Pringle. She also gives tours every year. You can sign up for one this year if you like, you know, predictably. I mean, she has confidence that she'll have crop circles to take you to because they happen every year, right? You're seeing how, how predictable it is. And what happened to her was she had a tennis injury that had been bothering her for quite some time and hadn't been resolved, hadn't figured out a medical um, solution to it. She went inside a crop circle, and after she left, she'd never felt that symptom again. She was completely fine. Yeah, the, this ache in her arm or whatever, it, what, 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 whatever pain it was that she'd had, completely gone. So she took a strong interest in finding out what does happen to people who go into crop circles. And not just people, but other effects. You know, for animals, for example, uh, animal behavior, dogs will bark in a panic, or cows will moo before a formation happens. They know that something is about to happen that's totally out of the ordinary. Animals, as you're well aware, often are more sensitive to certain things than we are. Um, sometimes birds will fly overhead, but rather than fly directly over the crop formation, the flock will part and then re rejoin after they've <laughs> Uh, after they pass the crop formation, they don't want to be uh, above the airspace of a crop formation for some reason. Um, mechanical failures. A, a truck has uh, sometimes can just, uh, you know, there, there was one time when a truck approached a formation and it just stalled out. It couldn't continue through. <laughs> Often there is a power outage the night of a crop formation. Um, and the audio effect mentioned there, sometimes there's a trilling sound 
that can be after the effect, after the fact. You know, people who come uh, to the formation to see it, they, they hear a trilling. It's almost as if the trilling sound is following them. So there are a lot of uh, special effects, I guess you could say, for these formations. Uh, here, here are some of the effects that uh, Lucy has, has documented. Here, these effects are all quite unpleasant. Uh, and except until you get to the bottom here, feelings of peace, love and light, and a sense of presence are also, and it seems to be, I'd, and I'd love to ask Lucy this question, are you more likely to have the positive feelings if the formation has mellowed somewhat? You know, and if you go in right after it happens, are you more likely to have the negative sensations? I don't know what's happening there. Um, this is her vi advice. If, don't visit one of these formations if you're pregnant or thinking of becoming pregnant. Don't visit if you have a pacemaker because it might throw that off. And don't bring your credit cards with you. They often get wiped. And, it, and, it's, and it's documented that very many times when you go inside a formation, anything digital, whether it's a watch, a cell phone, a, fo you know, a camera, all these things that are digital, they stop working. The, the battery drains, even, the, even if it's been recently charged. The battery drains mysteriously. You, you leave the formation, and it's working fine. You go back in the formation, it doesn't work again. What is going on here? Is it only a certain time of year that that takes place? I, don't know the answer to that question. I, well, the crops, them, the crop formations themselves. The, we we have now begun a crop season, a crop circle season. There are there were four in April already, and they always start with fairly simple formations, and then they get bigger as the season gets goes on. So we're, we have just begun a crop circle season. If you go to cropcircleconnector.com and select at the top of the left column latest circles, then you can see what's happening. You can see people's ideas, you know, comments about every, uh, you know, a, a whole series of photographs. Sometimes you'll see close-up photographs from the ground, comments, articles. What are people thinking about this one? So Crop Circle Connector is the place to go if you want to be up to date about what's happening in 2017. But if you want to see past, past formations, and I can't possibly show them all to you, of course, in this time, either go to Lucy Pringle's website, she has galleries of photos, or you can go to Steve Alexander's website, Temporary Temples. Temporary Temples. Because after all, these are temporary. These are plants that are going to die at the end of the year if they're not harvested, because they're, they're annuals, right? All those plants, you know, wheat, corn, those plants die. Um, so that's why they're temporary. The next year, it's a clean slate, isn't it? And, and farmers grow their crops again. Do you have a list of resources for that? Or maybe I'll write them down. If you go to my website, johnroot.net, and select Majesty and Mystery Crop Circles, and then select the handout, you, you can download it that way. So are, the new, are these happening in England, or are they happening in England? They do happen all over the world. But England is always, southern England is always the epicenter. It's always the best place in the world many more than elsewhere. They're bigger in, in, in general. They're bigger, they're more elaborate. Okay, many people experience dramatic life changes after going into a crop circle, rather like those who have a near-death experience. I've read many books about near-death experiences. It's a fascinating topic to me, and I think there's a lot to be learned from people who have experienced, who actually been on the other side, which I believe is the case. It's, it's almost like they're tourists who are coming back to, to tell us this is what you, what you will experience when you pass to the next side. And, and uh, near-death experiencers are never afraid of death after they've had their experience. They know with certainty that it's a, it's a place of ineffable beauty and love. That's, that's our, uh, what we have to look forward to, right? Um, so, but these crop circle experiences are being compared to, you know, you feel like you're in your own little world it's almost womb-like, totally secure. You may be limited physically, but not mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. You can access other levels of consciousness. And some people even report that they can heal others just from having been inside a crop circle. I have not. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity yet. So 
something happened to this formation, this uh, slide. I'm not sure why there aren't. It should be filled. You know, in July 1999, there were, there were at least 16. Um, that's one of them. A beam of light was filmed prior to the crop circle at that site. This is interesting, isn't it? These, it looks like there are cubes here that are suggested by the lines. Chinese yeah, Chinese deckers, right, yeah. Honeycomb. Yeah, honeycomb, yeah. Here's Silbury Hill again with another beautiful formation right across from Silbury Hill. Oh, I wish I had that slide because this shows uh, the formation from above. Here is the close-up of the magic basket. These plants are still standing in the, ri the ring, right? These plants are standing, but none of the rest. These are swirled here. These are laid out in, in almost like a checkerboard pattern. It reminds me a little bit of a pie with a, you know, the, right? <laughs> but, and that's why it's called the magic basket because, again, you know, the way that the, the, weave, the weaving effect, highly, highly complex. And again, doesn't this look in some ways like a basket with the plants here in the very, cir very center, they're swirled. Here they're going out, you know, pointing outwards. Here they're swirled again. Very controlled. I want you to appreciate the humor of this one where you have six five-pointed stars, and this one is a little bit different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, it's just floating off into space. Hey, get back here. You belong. <laughs> Your place is right here where the rest of us are. What are you doing over there? <laughs> and there's a similar humor about the asymmetry of this one. All these are supposed to be, well, maybe they're flames, right? They, look, they remind you of flames. But what's this one doing hiding inside here? It belongs out there with the rest of them, doesn't it? And I have no idea what created this effect, the way the plants are laid down. Do you remember in uh, science class where you could put the filings, iron filings on top of a piece of paper and have the magnet underneath the piece of paper and how the, the filings will arrange into this pattern? A pattern of interference. Back in the 1940s, when I was in elementary school, I remember seeing some of these configurations mm -hmm. in my history or geography. Okay. This one was called the angel. And how can it be that a poppy, and there were several of these poppies, red poppies, standing proud and tall with all of the crop surrounding them down? Well, the crop had been laid flat, had, bent, had been bent by the crop circle making energy. So suddenly, in the middle of the night, all these, these crops are, going, are pushed to the ground, they're bent, but the poppies totally unaffected, totally unaffected. So it must be some, it, it clearly can't be mechanically flattened because the poppies would be flattened too, right? Wow. Words fail me. So what feeling do you have when you see something like this? A feeling of awe? A feeling of that there's, you're looking at something sacred, aren't you? Isn't that sacred? I mean, to even conceive of a design like that is, is such an inspiration even to conceive of it.
Now, in 1974, this message was sent out, beamed out from this uh, telescope or, or this, this center, I uh, forget what it's called, uh, the, the, and, and the transmitting antenna dish, radio telescope in Arecibo. Tell, with all this information, all, all of it encoded in a, a binary code, and with the hopes that some, that perhaps thousands of years later, because it takes a long, long time for radio signals to get out far, far out into space, perhaps there'd be an answer. Well, it didn't take thousands of years, it just took a couple of decades. Here is Chill Bolton Observatory in England. Chill Bolton Observatory. There is a face right there, and there is their response. And what they said was, uh, this is who we are, right? This is a representation of a human. This is who we are. We're, we're smaller, but there are many more of us than there are of you. And our chemistry, remember this is all about chemistry. Our chemistry, instead of being organic chemistry, you might be aware, is all, all about the carbon atom. Organic chemistry is all about carbon. Carbon is surrounded by all, a lot of other atoms. And they're saying, our chemistry, our organic chemistry, is based on silicon. Very different, right? And this is what our genes look like, or, or you know, the, compared to this double helix, theirs is somewhat different. They were using this, they, they interpreted using the same code that was used to make this one, because it's, it's known how this, you know, how this was represented. And I think I'll end here because I've run out of time and I, or I could just, you know, keep on going and show you all the many other slides that I have. And it gives you the idea of just how they keep coming and they're so inspiring and they're so incredible and there's so, so much variety, right? And sometimes uh, uh, you have to wonder, right? Look at this. <laughs> Are we being blessed here? Do you have any connection with UFOs? That's a good question, a reasonable question. And I don't think that anyone can say conclusively that it's coming from a UFO, but it certainly is highly likely, it seems to me, that an intelligence and technology that is otherworldly, beyond what humans can do, right, um, is involved. I really don't think that a team of humans can be responsible for everything that we're seeing. And so wouldn't it be logical to assume, right, that this is in fact a gift from elsewhere? And how many people have seen UFOs, right? Marine light wheels, do a, do a search for marine light wheels. They're, they're another whole, you know, moving wheels of light, almost like um, fireworks in the water, if you will. You know, highly controlled bands of, of moving light. So, <laughs> you can see there are a lot of slides in this presentation. It's hard for me to stop when I make these. No more war was encoded in Morse code in, uh, in the field, the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And my, my uncle was shot out of the sky on D-Day. This is a very significant message to me. This was the, the, do you see how, here is the Morse code for the letter N, N, Morse code for O, three dashes, Morse code for, and so that's no, the first word, next word, M-O-R-E, next word, W-A-R. It's very clearly spelled out in English in Morse code. No more war. So don't you have this sense that we are being uh, g gifted, right? Gifted with these formations that speak to us. This is a universal symbol, the heart. I want to point out that all these random circles at the on, outside of the ring occur only on the right side of the heart. Draw an imaginary line right through the heart and you'll see there they are, right? But on the left side, they are not there at all. What does that mean? Something about our being, you know, being of right mind, being of right heart. <laughs> are we, 
Could it have to do with the left and right hemispheres of the brain? I don't know. All these things are mysteries, and everyone is being invited to understand them according to what their frame of reference is. But I think all of us are being invited to be humble, you know, have, you know uh, think that we're not the uh, ultimate, <laughs> right? I mean, we're a very young species after all, right? So there must be intelligence beyond us. They don't want anything to do with us because we're so wrong. Ah, but, but, they, but there is a lot of variety in this human species. Here we are, and none of us would want to say we're warlike. We're, we're paying attention to this. And don't you think that they have enough faith in us and love us enough and care us about us enough to be gifting us with these? And they have enough hope and confidence that this message is going to be heeded, that they keep giving them to us. They haven't given up on us. They've got their work out with Trump. They haven't given up on us, okay? They haven't given up on us. They seem to know so much. Did I see Da Vinci's? Uh, yes, band? you did see Da Vinci's, yeah. That was in, in Netherlands, that huge, absolutely, you know, astoundingly large symbol of, of the man with the two, you know, two hand positions, just like Leonardo da Vinci, but, but the, it was made into a butterfly man. Yeah, that wasn't from the Netherlands, yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah.